Hey! Welcome to Dollar Views. I'm Brian Gillis. And I'm Stephen Maltmanex. We're just a couple of Long Beach State film grads with a lifelong passion for cinema trying to put our money where our mouths are. And we decided to make our BAs mean something by offering our spoiler-free take on the latest film releases. Plus, any other media we've ingested over the past week. Whether that's the latest Buzzworthy show. An album that's been on constant rotation. That indie darling no one can shut up about. A cute romantic comedy. Or the latest Michael Bay masterpiece. We go over it all. One dollar. At a time. Once, when I was six years old, I believed something very simple. That what is most important is invisible to the eye. Well, this is our little corner of the universe. But then I grew up. I forgot all about being a child. We will find a way home. Until something miraculous happened. We will find a way. Hey, welcome to the Netflix episode. This isn't the first time we've done content from the streamer. Uh, we have Beast No Nation, Ridiculous 6, The Do-Over, also Daredevil Season 2, which was a mistake. I don't think we're ever going to review TV shows jointly again. So, you know, when we're feeling cheap, we do like sticking at home and giving our thoughts on what's new. So this week, it's the big one. Steve, you've seen this like four times now? The Five times. This is the oh, fifth Oh yeah, this one. is the fifth time. Yeah. The first time in English. I've seen yeah. this movie in two different languages. I also saw it in 3D, which unfortunately was not as awesome as I would have liked it to did be. Did you see this in theaters in France? No, I did not. I saw this when it was hitting DVD in uh, Switzerland. And that was way back in uh, like late like late November, <laughs> early December. No, like it it premiered Almost, like, like a little more than a year ago. It's funny because there is a really weird rebound, though, not just for the movie, but just for the story between France and the United States. It's written by Antoine de Saint Exupéry, who's a French author, but mm-hmm. he wrote it when he was in exile from uh, he was in New York because France was occupied by the Nazis during World War II. It was published in America first, in uh, in English and in French, before it even got to France. Yet, huh. you know, it's still this crowning uh, achievement yeah, by like a French, French author. Lit- yeah, like French ch- yeah. children's storybook Which like, masterpiece. Which wasn't published there till the end of the, uh, the Second World War, and he's already dead at this point. I don't know if it's a co-production, or I, it might be a Canadian-French production, but it's weird because it's, it's an American director... Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, I guess, you know, the more that I do research on Wikipedia of how they assemble this cast, they're talking specifically about the English cast. Yeah, the all-star cast. Yeah, but they got this all-star cast also in France, and that's where it hit theaters first. So well, the uh, like, only place they hit theaters, actually, really. Uh, well, not the rest of Europe. Like it was also. Well, I mean, I'm talking about the Western world. Yeah. You know, like the United States did not get a release for no. some reason, which is even weirder because I know you made a big deal about the custom Paramount logo, which is beautiful. And this is not a Paramount movie, and it's still there. I don't know how this works, because it's, I guess it's technically also a Paramount production. I guess they put some stake it, in it. They yeah, just it dropped the production. Yeah, which I no one still knows about. I remember Mark Osborne saying, like, right when that happened, like, later that week on Twitter, you know, oh, we got a surprise, and then, you know, we obviously saw it, because it's on Netflix, or you saw it other reasons. But, yeah, when the movie starts, you get the Paramount logo, then it says a Netflix production. Which was not there on the Blu-ray at all. Like that's Yeah, it's just thrown in there. I mean, yeah, that's that's really kind of the the only thing that's different. For some reason, the runtime is different on Netflix, but I did not notice any differences. Uh, Yeah, I mean, the only thing was obvious differences, like stuff in text, like, you know, the the school signs for the... uh, for the Academy or the foreclosure signs, like those are in English instead of in French, obviously. Like, but animated films are all like that. Uh, well, they no, just render them differently. I mean, differently. the story itself, though, the Little Prince's story is still in French in English in the American version. Yeah, like which the I text was for really it. Cool. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, and it's Academy with a EMI, so it's clearly in France. But I mean, aside from a historical perspective, the reason I'm bringing up both versions is I. I can't help but go back and forth because it is just so awkward watching this in English. I guess because, you know, the other version is just so ingrained in my head. But I also grew up with this book in French and just everything, like, you know, right from the prologue at the beginning. Like, Uh in English, you get the essence of what the story is and what it's about. But for some reason, just it doesn't sound as good in the English language. And there's like six different translations of the book in English. Uh, two of them which were within the past decade, so I don't think they can agree on 
how to best just encapsulate the romanticism of how it's supposed to sound in English because it's just yeah in French just the, the story just it, it flows off the tongue a lot better when you're reading it like I it it's the themes sound a bit more awkward and heavy-handed here in English for me but I still think the movie's great at the end of the day uh, this was my f introduction to the story I was familiar with the name I remember in high school uh, a peer of mine like bring the book to class and reading it so I knew what the little prince looked like but no I, I knew nothing about it I, I had no clue about its thematic musings about staying a child forever even when you grow up so it was it was pretty refreshing it was very original and this is kind of perfect at Netflix because it you could kind of adapt that message for the oh well when you're streaming you can do whatever you want and when you're at home like I'm sure someone's written something about like oh the little prince is the perfect Netflix movie and it kind of is. I still kind of wish I really saw it in theaters but I, I um, like I, I still like that at least this is getting uh, it's distributed on a platform that is very easily accessible I just I still don't know what to make out of it if it's just like way too easy to see it and it's a click away because I don't just something about the experience it's like it just doesn't feel as grand but it's still I, I, I don't know I, I always will prefer the theatrical experience over streaming and I am much more precious about these things than other people for them I'm sure it's it's not that big a deal maybe I really like this movie to an extent I love the its core theme its message the stop motion which I knew about going in mm -hmm. which is just gorgeous it really reminds it's like a mix between claymation and paper craft and then it's stop motion but it's kind of apparent that it was done on a computer and not done in the way that Leica does it um i would assume but it kind of reminded me of sony's uh, tearaway game on the playstation just the way that the world looks and if i'm correct in in assuming the story the little prince is strictly the stop motion stuff yeah it's the like the story it's, that the aviator gives the girl that's it and it's also it's out of order it's not the entire story it's like i hesitate to call this an adaptation because it's really just mm -hmm. fragments of it yeah but it still really works though like i really like how uh, it, it's sort of throughout i guess i keep thinking of the lego movie when i'm watching this movie just the message or, of lego uh, movie and that this Bride, is kind of well it, but th there is that too but this is like taking something that exists and making something new out of it mm -hmm. that's not just it's not really you know trying to make it new for somebody it's more of a passing of the torch it's of, also just uh, the story is what like 40 pages 30 pages it's not a long picture book and so to even try to make this into a feature length movie you have to come up with something different well then there's also other uh animated films i i might have seen one of them as a kid i really can't remember which one yeah but i'm sure like there's probably half hour shorts or half hour specials there might be oh, a yeah, full-length movie as this far would as would be I a know. perfect little 30 minute movie yeah if it, you just took the source material like, if, i wish I, I mean you do have the blu-ray maybe it's there is there a just a linear version of the actual adaptation no. in the stop motion no, no that would have been amazing no it's it's if not packed get... with bonus features and i uh. again you know that's one of those things where i bounce back on different versions because there's featurettes with the filmmakers but then with the french voice actors and it's i, I really it's weird i don't know what to call the original version of this movie <laughs> but it's i guess it's a it's a bit of both hmm yeah, no, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about that, but I mean, like, you know, regardless of, even though, yeah, I'm going to bounce back and forth between uh, languages here, but uh, yeah, I do, the 2D animated stuff is great as far as bringing the book, but what I really, I think I love here more is just the character animation for these new characters in the CG world, like, just how well realized the present day world is, like, just the way that, you know, these characters move, how they fit their personalities, like, you know, I guess right off the bat, to give you an example, like, there's that moment where... She's standing in front of the school board, and it's a combination of, you know, the way that the scene is lit, uh, the position of all the school board members there, the music, how they're just all moving in, si in sync. And you not only do you have, like, that mundane sort of... Um, the volcano thing going for it. How did... What? Oh, you haven't seen I that. I have not seen that, so I wouldn't get that, but... It, um, the way that they perceive the the workforce is pretty much exactly the same way in this movie everyone's wearing black and grays and whites mm -hmm. they move in kind of like military fashion just like oh that's an it's another day at work all the cars are going in order everyone goes to the refinery that just do it we need to you know make our living we have to be adults um so I, I have a feeling like mark osborne really borrowed from that film 
in that way. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. Like they they all do the same thing, organizing their books the same way, flipping the pages. And they're all like very intimidating when they do it too. It's there's so many great like I I notice it more and more every time I see it. But like there's subtle touches. Like I love the fact that for the pin uh, that says friend on it, you know when the mom first puts it on there begrudgingly. Mm-hmm. Later on, when she takes it off, like, you know, the first off, like, yeah, she draws the beard. She assumes that the friend is a girl, and that's what she draws on there. And I could go on and on, but I mean, yeah, like, little things, like, when she's throwing away the rose, how you don't see the trash bins there, but then, you know, they come up, and it's right when the aviator's about to wave high, and then he stops before he even gets the chance. There's some real interesting um, headroom here, where, for instance, like, the one of the first shots they have when they get to their new house, and they have the life goal board or whatever Mm -hmm. you want to call it up there and then the characters come to frame the mom and the daughter and their heads are like below the halfway point and it's very obvious that the centralized figure in that shot is the board like it's the thing that's important the this ominous frightening almost antagonistic character for the first half of the film just real interesting artistic choices yeah i mean i could go back and forth but like just every this is like pixar quality animation in the sense that like every shot is so carefully chosen i'd say it's closer to dreamworks just in terms of the animation style of the of the real world but yeah it's it's the animation itself like the way things move yeah yeah it's uh very smart especially when you get later in the film and you get these callbacks kind of like opening closing images or Mm -hmm. these little like codas very brilliant um even when you get to the film's uh, credits and they scroll in reverse. Yeah. Little things like that that make a big difference in terms of just like, oh, this isn't a movie like all the others. Probably my favorite shot in the film is uh, when they're flying kites together and then you see the, the shadow of the kite on the building, on the houses, and then it turns into the plane silhouette and then it turns into the little prince flying with the, the birds. Just real smart, real, just like a quick little shot. I think maybe it's on screen for five seconds. And it was enough that it kind of cemented that this is a fantasy world, that this isn't exactly our reality. It's not necessarily reality. For me, it's more about just still having this childlike sense of water, wonder, (laughs) not water. uh, And uh, yeah, I could use some water. I'm really tired. (laughs) Um, It's hot out here in Texas. Um... But it, like it's it's that and just being able to still have this open imagination and like it's mm-hmm. it's really like that's part of the theme of the movie like is just you know still like a central theme yeah yeah is just of not losing you know these best aspects of childhood like being able to function in adulthood kind but of not reminded me of um of Hook Steven Soderbergh's movie which just celebrated its twenty fifth anniversary this week and also rest in peace to Robin Williams another one I have now. not seen actually that makes um, it five. I mean, you can just assume if you know the Peter Pan story, but the the central theme there is it's similar to this. It's yeah. like you can grow up just remember fantasy, remember to like the the brilliance of everything around you, and just to to be enamored by by beauty, like to to remain creative even if you're being dr- like drugged down by having to pay your bills, yeah. and, and feed your kids, and all of these mundane things around you just to to stay a child regardless like well, it's don't about, change it's about holding that that sense of wonder not necessarily of being lost in that childlike state of mind of oh you know i just want to play and mm-hmm. and watch watch tv and you know just play video games all day and not do kinda shit like, um, no it's like you still have to it, you you kind of just grow and change and you take the best parts of yourself with you as you get older i mean like toy story 3 does a similar thing yeah. you know that one that, that final shot with andy when he plays with his toys mm-hmm. kind of what this movie is you know it's it, it just it, it really hammers it on there for the for a big part of it um and i think that's what i liked about it the most i mean just instead of being another cog in the wheel uh, going to the worth academy where you have to be essential mm-hmm. um which i i love when they throw that back in 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 the the epilogue even though or not epilogue but that final act even if i don't actually like that final act itself i, I did like how a lot of things came back the characters were, were put on screen again and some of these notions and and the way things are classified also kind of remind me of have you seen um was it dark world no i think that's the name of it it, uh, I, it, it sounds it? familiar but it's not By, so much uh, seen. it's like alejandro Deha, the guy that did the crow uh no yeah. that's uh alex proyas proyas yeah is it called dark world dark city that's it yeah. i was so close I have se- okay, I've seen it. Um but yeah, the the way that that final like planetoid asteroid very serious people place is it very much reminded me of Dark City. There's you you can tell they they had a lot of influences here. 
um, just the way that the adult world is portrayed. Well, it also reminded me, and I don't know if you saw this in film school, a lot of people did, and it's some that's tough to get a hold of, but King Vidor's The Crowd. Um, like, there were shots, yeah. especially, that were very reminiscent of that. There's also uh, the, the, some the Terry camera. Gilliam Brazil in there. Yeah, some Brazil, too. Yeah, it's it's basically, it, like, that third act, it's like The Wizard of Oz, except if she goes into any one of those movies. Yeah, the reverse. Yeah. yeah like, I, I've seen, I saw a little bit of The Crowd, or, like, Man with the Motion, uh, with the motion Camera. Um, has something like that, or like even though Jess's step sequence in uh, Battleship Potemkin, <laughs> just it's it's chaotic and no one really cares about anyone but themselves and making sure that they're okay. Like I I had this moment. I mean, you had a stuffed animal growing up, right? Yeah. Who didn't? Uh, I mean, right. Like, there's things well, that you're attached to. Yeah. When you think about it now, you're like, why did I carry around this beanbag with an animal? But as a kid, it had a personality. It was like your friend. And I really loved in the latter moments of this film when that fox comes to life, when it becomes I told you, a, right? a character in the story, because it, it just reminded me. I was like, yeah, I could see myself when I was younger that that would be me, that I, you know, it had a voice, it had a name, it had certain likes and dislikes, it had a favorite food. And I even had, well, I didn't have a fox, my, a friend of mine had a fox that looked just like, I had a squirrel. <laughs> Among other things, I did have um, a Tigger, and I freaking loved that Tigger. Thing. Like, yeah, when I watched Winnie the Pooh, that was my favorite character. It, it brought me back to that. Like, it made me remember how I thought they were. Um, so, I think that's probably the the strongest emotional impact I had from this film. I told that it you, kind when of I got me back into that mindset for you know the 20 30 40 minutes that that happened i told you when i first reviewed this movie on uh back on two cents when we still did that i said it this movie has the most badass stuffed animal that you'll ever see oh yeah yeah and uh, it's it's yeah. i don't know oh, i don't come on, i, I come really on. like the puppet in idle hands i have not seen end. that oh yeah check that out <laughs> okay back to this um yeah uh okay uh the cast um rachel mcadams ricky gervais you get paul rudd Jeff Bridges, who is not that good. <laughs> Honestly, there's things that kind of distracted me about this English. I mean, like maybe just because I'm much more aware of who they are that I uh -huh. couldn't surrender to the wonder anymore. But it felt like DreamWorks, like they're just pimping out these celebrity voices. I didn't recognize anyone besides Jeff Bridges. I, yeah, you know, I, I kind of knew he was in here, but Paul Rudd, he, I got lost. That in the character. distracted me. Like I, you know, I could not take that character as seriously. It felt like just a bumbling Paul Rudd, and it like it. Well, you know, I didn't like that character to begin with. Like I said, I do not like that final act. I had problems with that final act when I first saw it, and I think I mentioned it on Two Cents. But yeah, like when you see that character, it was a bit more of a blow for me, but. You know, now that I know that's Paul Rudd, it's just it, it feels like a celebrity voice tacked on there, and you know, I, I guess it's fine. Like it's it's not a problem with the movie. It's just I I have far more of an attachment to this story in a different uh, in a different language. Uh, I could say that Prince. about so many. Yeah, like I mean, it's like Jeff Bridges. You know, I all I hear when he's on screen is I hear the dude, you know, like the guy that did the voice. Um, um I don't hear the dude here. Well, it's I, like, I, the guy that did the voice in French, though, Andre Dussolier, like has this, you know, kind of wise old man quality to his voice with like a childlike uh -huh. sense of wonder. And he doesn't ever sound confused. Like he just sounds like a really nice old guy. Jeff Bridges just like here. It seems like he's high most of the time. Like it's just, that's how I hear it. Like, you know, just the way he says things, he's just like, Oh yeah, you know I'm I'm a hoarder. Like, uh, I I don't know. You get to that um th that scene when he gets pulled over too. Like he he genuinely like seems very senile in places. There's some fairly weird things that happen in this movie. It's fantastical and yet it tries to be grounded. I think the problem that I have with it primarily is that it feels a little disjointed, partially because of its different uses of animation also because of the two worlds that it portrays and they do converge towards the end mm -hmm. um but just it, it seems a little open-ended like you get that final act that i mentioned and there isn't exactly closure for it you brought up uh, brazil uh bringing up another terry gilliam movie have you seen the uh, misadventures of baron moon uh Chowson? no no it the planet stuff here really reminded me of that where you have this like central figure there that does certain things robin williams is in that uh, a couple other people. Really interesting film. Lots of his uh, Monty Python brothers. You should check that one out. Really bizarre. If you like his more weird shit like Brazil, you, you'll probably really dig it. Um, yeah, I, I want to buy this one. 
just because of its core message and like i said that stop motion that is just fucking gorgeous um but it, it feels like it drops the ball a little too much for me in certain areas I, I highly recommend it, especially because it's on Netflix. What else are you going to do with your time? Everyone's already seen Stranger Things. Well, not me, but most people. So, you know, if you got an hour and a half, you should check it out. And if you have any, you know, special spot in your heart for the story, which I don't, I think you owe it to yourself to see, as far as I can tell, a fairly close adaptation. Just I I don't know if I can put it on the pinnacle, on our, our small pedestal, which is the I'd buy that for a dollar recommendation list. Well, I've already bought it, um, yeah, but I, I gotta times. say, I, I, your echo, your sentiments sort of echo my first impression when I saw it because I was a little conflicted at how disjointed some of these things felt, but uh-huh. it did grow on me over time. And like you know, the moment I can see that, yeah, yeah, and it's, it's. So I'm not saying that that's going to happen for you, but I do think that experience for me, that's really an indicator that like this thing will still leave an impression. It may not be perfect, but I think you'll still at least be thinking about it. There's still... Uh, oh, yeah. It's, it's, I'll, it's I'll be thinking about point. this yeah. movie. I'll probably reference it, probably recommend to people today just in conversation, like, oh, have you seen that Little Prince movie? Um, but at the same time, I'm not sure if it's something that I'm going to revisit anytime soon. Well, it also like, does hold a really special spot for me, though. I mean, But it is a very specific version of that film. Like, you know, I, I'm not going to... It's It's not like I can recommend this one any less, and... I'm probably talking about this and no one cares, but it's like, wow, yeah. I mean, seeing this in English was way more distracting for me. I mean, like, just things like, I don't know, seeing um, James Franco as the fox, like, all, all I start thinking about is uh, yes, Pineapple yeah, Express, whereas Vincent I didn't Cassell, know that you know, yeah, Vincent Cassell was the one in French, and that made more sense that, to me. Like, yeah, his not, voice seems like that's a better match. I wasn't looking for James Franco. I could just tell right away. Like, I heard, I was thinking, like, did, did he... It sounds like he was recording Sausage Party, smoked some weed, temporarily walked into the Little Prince booth, lent his voice, and then just went back. Like, that's that's all I hear, but, uh, y- you know, I'm, I'm joking, but honestly, like, it was it was way more distracting for me. Like, I guess the celebrity voices here, they just, they don't really fit, but that's probably because I'm way too attached to another version of this film. That possibly, like I said, I didn't, I listened to this with my 5.1 uh, headphones, and I didn't pinpoint any of the voices. Besides yeah, so Jeff I mean, Bridges. it's like, like when I, it's I watched not the credits, like everyone's going to have the same experience as me yeah. for sure on that. Like I watched the credits, I was like, oh, that was Benicio del Toro. That that was James Franco. Like I just I had no reason to be looking for him. I was just trying to watch the movie at face value, mm-hmm. and so I kind of got lost in it. In that, besides Jeff Bridges, and I mean the character himself, the Aviator, kind of also reminds me of Jeff Bridges himself, even if he looks differently. I have to imagine his performance in The Giver is pretty similar to this one. Well, I mean, it's, it's not all, it's kind of like a weird blend of um, of uh, Kevin Flynn and Tron Legacy for me, and, a little and bit, The yeah. Dude. Like, I, I don't know, it's just, it's it's very, I, I swear, it just sounds like way, way too loose and casual for me, honestly. But, um, I, you know, I, I do think, like, there is still, at least, even in English, there is still that relationship that's there that works and that's charming enough on its own terms. It's just uh, not as strong for me and not as endearing. Yeah, I I checked Netflix. This isn't in French. No, on, I, tr- I looked. Because, yeah, it's I mean, I, it's, you can do it in Spanish, serious. you can do it in English. But I there was isn't a French so option. close to, like, changing it several times. Like, you know, especially when the songs for this movie by Camille, like, which... Really good, yeah. Uh, oh my! In English, like uh, so distracting for me. Like they just, they did not. It's one of those things where they did not sound the same. It's like I know what the song sounds like in French, but in English, just yeah, I, I don't know. Just it, it really did not work for me. I, I kept wanting to change it like several times just because I was like, yeah, this is, it's wrong. Like the language is wrong. It just it, it doesn't sound like the movie to me but yeah I'd probably again watch that's my this bias ag- no i'd probably watch this again in french because you you are yeah. right some things in french do sound differently like, like it it's better. it's like watching a miyazaki movie with the english, english dub version yeah. you know like, which is all i've ever done i think besides for my neighbor totoro like i've done those for i saw the wind rises that way and it's like i have not like, seen that movie in japanese but i can tell watching it like yeah how's moving sound castle right. in english is awesome because you got christian bale and billy crystal which is just cool. So I, sometimes it can help a movie. And at the same time, like, I can't imagine watching Shrek in French. Like, who does 
Eddie Murphy, you know, who does <laughs> Mike Myers. Like, there's certain movies, and maybe this is one of them for you, where a language just suits it, and the source material and how pivotal it is to French culture kind of makes sense why you wouldn't be able to disassociate this with the language of its origin. Well, like then this took viable. me back to watching a movie as a kid, and, you know, like, it might sound like blasphemy, but there's Disney movies that I cannot watch in English. Like, I cannot watch Toy Story in English, even though I've seen the sequels that way. Yeah, it's a I, personal problem. I can't see uh, <laughs> The Land Before Time in English or Aladdin or... Uh, I can't even watch Space Jam in English unless I'm seeing what? Master Pancake Mock. I'm not kidding. It's, like I have it's Michael Jordan. What do you? What? I I freaking love that movie and I always Looney saw it Tunes in French. In yeah. French can't be that good. Uh, no, it's it's still when you're a I kid, you're imagine, not looking for the language. You're still laughing. I'm at just the saying I can't comedy. imagine listening to Bugs Bunny in French. It works. Like, or, for, like, for me, but that's a nostalgia thing, honestly. That has uh, but, to be a nostalgia. But, you know, unless I mean, I'm watching movie, Master Pancake mock Space Jam, then yeah, I'm watching it That whole movie French. is a nostalgia thing, though, mind you. Like, oh, yeah, I, no, absolutely. If like, I watch it for the first time today, I'm like, what the fuck is this? It's not a good movie. No, it isn't. <laughs> I think, no, it's it is a good idea. movie. No, it isn't a good movie. It's it, a like, good movie. What we loved as kids was the idea. It's, it's the same reason we loved Roger Rabbit, was crossing something that was animation into live action but i mean also you know with space jam it's taking something that's real someone that you know exists and like crossing them over with these fictional characters that you love the idea of it is fucking awesome as a kid well what's the idea of Tallulah? what would you think of that one oh, <laughs> that is a wonderful segue oh, I, I i'm on a timetable here yeah i know um Mrs. Money? Who are you? I'm a friend of Nico's. I really need to find him. I can't help you. I haven't seen my son in two years. He took all my money, okay? I don't know who you are. I have his fucking name tattooed on my hand. So what? You're looking for money? What about like five bucks? Oh my god. Are you housekeeping? Yes. This is Madison. Can you watch her for me? I don't know much about kids, so... This is too much for me. Nobody ever tells you how hard it's gonna be. I see all these women on TV and on the street and they're doing it and I... I don't know how. It's okay. No one puts baby in a corner. It, I, I'm gonna forget about this movie real quick. Like you talked about this before on Two Cents. I forget the director and a writer of this movie. Ago, yeah. It's something she that works on, on uh, Orange is the New Orange Black. Is the New Black, yeah. I... I, I really was just watching this and kind of thinking, whatever, you know, it, it didn't make an impression on me. I didn't care. Um, like Pretty generic Sundance flick. Th I mean, the best I can say about it is like, hey, you know, they have, uh, uh, I, I don't even, I was more excited to talk about the little the Prince, Juno obviously. Um, yeah, but, um, and like who, who plays the mom? Yeah, I'm not ready for this conversation. Like CJ Craig. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's some good discussions about, you know, relationship and monogamy, like throughout the movie. And I, it's all really just based around Ellen Page taking this baby, but it's one of those things where like, there's this plot that just exists for the sake of moving these things forward. Like, right when she takes the baby, like, I, I feel like it, it just, it could have been constructed better because there was a good setup there, but like, no, she just kind of takes it. Why? Just because, uh, you know, the baby's crying. And then... And I thought it was deeper than that. Like, the reason she took the baby is because she wanted to leave. She was, you know, going there to... This is a fucking yeah, mendicant. It was a spur, a, a it was a spur in person. the moment in, like decision. It wasn't like a, I honestly feel that this is a bad mother and I have to protect this kid somehow. There was no... No, 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 no. Not not initially. Like I think it was more of a, I want to leave. This bitch is knocked out and drunk. Mm -hmm. And I can't leave because this baby is crying. And if she's crying, the mom's going to wake up. Then she'll probably notice that I robbed her. Then why would you leave? <laughs> she probably just took her because she's alone. I mean, her boyfriend just ditched her. She's got these parking tickets. Her life fucking sucks. Well, yeah, I mean, and I understand she that. She wanted but none... to be comfortable, and that's why she tries to return the baby the next morning. And it was too late for that. See, her actions don't make that much sense to me, though. And it's it's also like it, not just that, but like scenes where the mother almost tracks her down with the baby, like the melodramatic eh. scenes like that that are constructed, like obviously to build up tension because we're at that point where the story has to wrap up, but. Like it, it, it's just like eh, these things felt very deliberate to me and like a little disingenuous and I mean there's there's good scenes in this movie that uh, present interesting points about like modern marriage and you know this idea of family and it's like I, you know it's not like it's a movie I don't um, I'm not gonna say don't watch it mm -hmm. but it, I mean I ultimately was left I guess I was left with things like that I found were I was watching and I thought they were interesting as I was watching them and I guess they 
they provide some decent insights and points of view into modern marriages and relationships and yeah like that line about uh marriage is yeah. just the cornerstone of the patriarchal society well, and also just existence like what why do we have kids and if there's if they're brought in for really kind of, kind of no like valid reason then what's their what's their meaning in this world things like that uh what would happen if you were to die in a single moment how like just th- there's a lot of deep uh deep thoughts in here that you can have in conversation and I think it has a good plot for it. It's just like, I don't know, the way that's set up, I really didn't care particularly about anybody. And at the end, I ultimately felt that this was very average and inconsequential. But I guess I could, you could also argue the point that this is supposed to be about very normal, average people. Yeah. Like There's this nothing... movie to me was just, it, it's probably a really great screenplay. Like reading this thing is probably great. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's an average movie. It's not much better than a Lifetime flick. Um, but I like the little meaningless everyday things that are shown on camera that you usually don't get. So like I said, Ellen Page, you see her tits in the beginning for a sex scene. Right after the sex scene, they're brushing their teeth and, like, eating. They're doing normal things. You got, like, Ellen Can Page... Can I go back to The Little Prince real quick? And I just... Huh. I, I've, I've, you just reminded me of something I should have mentioned. But another thing I love in the animation is how how characters are presented in that movie. Oh, does, like, the brush, when they're the brushing teeth their brushing. teeth, and it's like they're yeah. doing everything in sync. And then every, like, you know... It, and then it's the not next exactly time they subtle. brush their teeth, they're, they're not on the same... They're just getting more and more out of sync. Yeah. And it's, like, little things like that where I'm like, fuck, it, it's just so well designed just like how the choices out, that yeah. they make and what characters do how they interact within that world and just the way it's shot to end that, that's i let's get back to this but yeah. yeah i i really enjoy when you see things in movies that you never see you know you never see someone take a piss definitely don't take a shit unless he's, it's for like a comedic reason like Aaron kumar with the battle shit scene mm-hmm. like it's not something that happens really and you get food here you got theft, you got brushing teeth, you get bathing, you get changing diapers. You get a, a lot of these random things. You you know, you get a, what's her name's baby, or a turtle dying, mm-hmm. which in a normal movie wouldn't mean anything, but up until that point, it's like everything to the character. It's all she's got. Um, it's like, yeah, I do like those little things as well, like just in movies in general. Because I mean, it's nicer, though, when they're characters that I like and they're movies that I like, and especially... I think they have a bigger effect on me in like bigger blog, uh, in yeah, bigger, the bigger budget the movies. Movie, like, the, yeah, it well, it's like you know, let's, it. you know, bring up for example something like Batman versus Superman. Just that moment when uh, Clark calls his mom, you know, which or, like or hey, better if, yet, if, when uh, in Suicide Squad, when when Rick Flag is eating chicken, looking out the window. Okay, but the specific <laughs> point that I'm making here is like, hey, when you move away from home. And you're just, you're feeling kind of lonely. And like, you know, he's got so many reasons just to be completely down. And what does he do? He just calls and says his mom, talks to him that he just calls and talks to his mom just to say hi. Like j- just to see, hear like a certain voice. It doesn't really advance the movie, but it's a nice that's little thing. Yeah. That's why it wasn't in the theatrical cut because it didn't advance the movie. Like I started writing my screenplay again. I did like four pages over the last couple of days and I was re- like, I did a reread the other day, and I was noticing that I don't have a lot of those little things. Like, there is, yes, there's a single scene where there's some food being consumed, but it's something that we take for granted. And maybe it's because the audience, like a audience rather, doesn't care for those kind of things. Because when you do it every day, you know, when you bathe, when you eat, when you whatever, why would you want to spend time in a movie that you just paid to do, like, to see? to see the things that you do anyway. Well, so no, for see, the most part, for for normal movies, for the average film, for the successful movies, it generally just isn't shown, I think, for, you know, not necessarily because this is a fantasy, but it is an escape. Like, you don't want to be reminded about your everyday little trivial things. But this whole film, Tulula in general, is about those things. It's about, like you said, it's about marriage mm-hmm. and romance and about doing the right thing and the the blurry lines between ethics. It's just it kind of is a little too, not whimsical, but all over the place for me. The weird little like flashbacks that happen, while they're like cut well, they, it l- really blends reality with the past. It just... Well, but that's the thing. It's supposed to feel like a memory, and I think it works in that sense. It it works that way, but it's still... Where the fuck did this come from? I don't... Like, the first time it happened, anyway. I wouldn't say it bothers me, but, I mean, you know, just getting back to your point of, like, characters doing mundane stuff, the thing that I'm interested in is, like, I I Mm -hmm. like seeing it, but I like seeing it at a point where 
it's it's pretty critical where it makes sense to see it because uh, you know in life like you just have those moments where no matter how chaotic things are you have those moments where you're just alone and you have a little bit of time to decompress like the cliche of it is looking in the mirror and like just you you look at yourself and i don't know you're kind of processing all these things but i am interested in moments like that where just what people do when they have time just to be by themselves mm -hmm. You know, I, like that's it, probably, and it could be little things like, hey, you're stressed out, and then you you just sit down, you don't have your phone out or anything, you just you could be taking a shit, yeah. and you just sit there and you have like you're kind of just letting everything just dissolve. Right, someone's there. doing something mundane, but it's elevated because it's the movie. You just you don't get a lot of that, even in TV shows. Really, it doesn't matter if it's on Netflix or HBO. Like, if you watch Game of Thrones, no one's ever doing nothing. It's always something to progress the story, and movies are that way too, unless you're watching something like by Linklater or it's an art film. And I mean, like before Sunrise, for instance, like, what? It's a movie where they're walking the streets and talking to strangers? Like, you know, that's not a general film. Well, but and it's also, in movies, you rarely get scenes where people are alone. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a big thing. Like, usually when you get them, they're very pivotal, or it's just, you know, it's a survival story of some sort. Yeah, like but Castaway. But yeah, like, everyone's he's... always communicating with someone, and it's always building up to something, like a story with multiple characters and in a world full of people. Like, Tom Hanks in Castaway, he's alone the whole movie, unless mm -hmm. you count Wilson. But he never does these things. You never see him taking a shit. Like, yeah, like, he might remove well, a no. tooth. At, but also, but, like, a great thing is, like, you could add I Am Legend. There's little things where Will Smith, you know, he's doing all these basic mundane things just to have some dog, sort though. of sense. Yeah, he has a dog, but he's trying to have some sense of reality. Yeah. Like, you know, he goes into the DVD store and pretends to rent something. Like, yeah, every talking time. Talking to the, the cashier, like, oh, you don't yeah. recommend this one? Um, I think that's probably the best thing about Swiss Army Man, which is still my favorite movie of the year, <laughs> is that, you know, it, it has the castaway setup it has the before sunrise setup it's just the things that are there are like this movie they are very mundane it's like how to creep on someone how to take pictures how to fart you know like just these random fucking things that shouldn't matter but just the way that they're shown makes them important so i like this movie i like Tallulah for those reasons but no i didn't really like the movie on the whole i mean it is very melodramatic yeah, when the cops get involved it gets very serious there's like almost no humor in it besides the camaraderie between Alice and Janney and Ellen Page. And it's still just Ellen Page being Ellen Page. Like, this kind of seems like it could have been a serial sequel to Juno. Juno it's like, yeah. after she gave the baby away for adoption, she started, you know, traveling around the country in her van, and then she got upset that she lo she left her baby, so she stole the baby. Like, it, it kind of, just their dynamic and the fact that Ellen Page, even though she's, like, 28, looks like she's 17 forever. Um... <laughs> I, I'm curious about her career when she ages. Like, is she going to stop acting because no one wants to hire her? No, like, no, no, like, come on. I, everyone evolves I don't know. into different roles. Like Some people. I, regardless of age, I think. But, I, you know, I eh, really, it's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm pretty much there with you. It's like, there, there's good themes here, but mm -hmm. it's really plot and just how characters interact. Like, I, you know, I don't feel like these things happen organically. Ellen Page just kind of shows up. Allison Janney just kind of accepts her and I mean I can I can sort of accept how desperate people they'll accept uh you know just anyone in their yeah. life when they hit such a low point and stuff like that like or, you want I don't happiness know, it, at any cost that you'll accept things even if yeah you think it's, it's a like lie. the stuff with uh you know the the man the doorman down in the yeah. hotel like even though that yeah that stuff really Pretty I, I, weird. Get, I guess and I see there the was no closure there. either yeah though. Really, I weird. mean, yeah, it's I, I just I, I really don't have much to say about this movie. I can compliment it on its um, thematically with where it stands, but I, it honestly does not make an impression on me. But I'm sure for someone, it'll definitely resonate. Yeah, there's good acting. There's an interesting story that you don't see frequently in mm -hmm. a big movie. Like I said, this is a lifetime movie. This is a movie of the week type things. Oh, my baby was stolen. Help me find it. Like the milk carton baby, the movie. But it's it's done a little bit better. You know, like this is a Sundance favorite. Yeah. Big buy for Netflix. And I'm sure anyone that's a fan of Juno or of Orange is the New Black is probably going to check this out just for the people attached in name value alone. Yeah, um, it's for instance, totally... I, oh. Zachary Quinno. He has a really cool, basically, cameo in this movie. <laughs> um, I like that scene. He's, like, playing the gay partner of uh, the brother from The Big C, who mm -hmm. I hadn't seen in anything since that show. Um, so, there, you know, there, there's good talent involved. It's just not 
This isn't a must watch. It's it, perfectly it's, fine. You know, it's a like, fine little like Thursday night movie. You don't have any plans. You want to watch something on Netflix, and that's why it's an okay movie. Like because this is the perfect Netflix movie. It's like I don't want to watch a whole TV show. I'm not into binging anything. I just finished watching this. Let me watch a movie real quick, and this kind of checks all the boxes. It's what you need um, on like any given night. I just want to give it more credit because, you know, it like it does have some very important ideas, just like, yeah, yeah. modern marriage, you know, um, relationships, um, just like, you know, Nuclear it's, it's family not, it's not and what that means. Yeah, I mean, it has good ideas, but I it's not as deep, I think, as another movie that came out this weekend. Um, this is my sausage party segue. <laughs> Why on earth you have no interest in seeing this will really puzzle me because... I told you. I've got no interest in a hard R Toy Story. Okay, well, it's not a hard R Toy Story. It, I guess, yeah, if you want... That's like With the food. easy descriptor, and it's not even that great of one, honestly. Like, this uh, this is... Okay, I, I guess I could throw in Toy Story 3 because it's really as tightly scripted and fast-paced as the breakout for the... Um, for that movie and yeah, like daycare. it kicks about as much ass as that it's just an r-rated version of that but seriously this movie like not only is it hilarious like not only was i with the in a sold out theater just left my ass off it's the smartest script that has come out so far this year swiss army man no doubt it like swiss army man like you know deals with like uh personal existential thoughts this movie it's a satire on religion you know like just well they are so many bad diff- it's called the night before Oh come no come on this or this is the end. Have you seen them? Or uh, have you seen the night before? No. Okay, well then shut the fuck up. I say that. I know respectfully. it's about. Christmas. I say that respectfully. I, I seriously you making Christmas jokes. You should see this movie in theaters if you get the chance because it is fucking brilliant. Like, I I can't I I, I don't know what, what else I can really say. Like I yeah, have it's, the it's Fandango great... credit. I mm-hmm. could go see something. I'd rather see Kubo and the Two Strings. Oh man, you're killing me. This is one of the best movies of the year. It's gonna be in my top ten at the end of the year. Like it's a shoe in. I'm it's, not like it's a it's, crazy it's... Seth Rogen fan anymore. Well, I mean, like, I know the thing he's is funny. Like... I'm sure the animation in this is great. But every single trailer I've seen, I'm just like, yeah, I'm sure this has a good amount of laughs. I'll probably like it. But not enough that I want to go to the theater. Well, it's like, a I'll definitely more th- see it on cable. It truly is really a thought-provoking movie. Like it tackles so much, like the rules that are set for how we're supposed to function in this world, like the rules that we follow. Um, y- you know, and then like th- just <laughs> it, it definitely goes in an absurd route. I really I don't want to give away what this movie is trying to say at the end, but I, I think you know you've probably read enough and you get it at this point. And no, I haven't read like, anything on it. I mean, I've seen some, some. I think I've seen most of the publicity. Like, it's hard not to when you watch Preacher, but I, I, and I've seen Seth Rogen tweet about it, and I've seen like little things that other people have said, but I haven't read a review. I haven't read any articles. I just, I have my own kind of image in my head, and I, like I said, I, I'm sure it's a good one. It's just sometimes you don't go out to see the movie, even if you think it's you're gonna enjoy it. Like, oh, it's, for well. instance, if you lived in Southern California still, mm-hmm. and you're like. You, you want to record this? You want to do an episode for this? Like, yeah, sure, I'll watch that with you. But I don't have anyone that's interested in this or at least has said anything about it. That Everyone's killing me. This is one of those movies that I would go out and see with someone or a group of people, but not by myself. Watching a comedy by yourself is kind of depressing. Yeah, so there's so many movie... things about this movie that people mm-hmm. are just not going to be able to forget. Like, it's fucking weird, and, and it's so absurd, but yet hits on so many truths. And the fact that they're able to pull that off is like uh, i mean yeah you know these guys they're like the modern uh bill murray or uh, you know f- who was from the 80s or john belushi in the 70s or adam sandler in the 90s you know like they fucking own this decade perhaps they don't own it on tv um i finished preacher a couple days ago i watched the whole season kind of unwillingly i i, I had to as a fan of the comic I had to because we talked about on the show on Two Cents so much. The entire first season is basically the first issue of the comic. It ends where the first issue basically ends. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. When I spend 10 hours on a show and the adventure finally starts when the season's over, I get why they had to sell an audience. They try to do a more grounded concept by making preacher actually a preacher for the first season totally get it it's just as a fan there wasn't enough for me to want to come back like if this i have a feeling like the second season is going to be phenomenal 
But are you going to stick with it? I'll watch the season premiere. If they don't deliver what they set up at the finale, I'll stop watching. Because the Saint of All Killers, he's the best thing about the first season. He's probably the one of the best things about the comic. He doesn't really get introduced introduced until the season finale. That uh, this is a spoiler, I guess, in terms of the show, but like I said in the comic, it's the first issue. It's one of the first panels. Anvil doesn't blow up. The town that the the show takes place in doesn't blow up until like the final shot of the season. If if you've never seen or read a, a preacher comic, if you're a fan of Seth Rogen and AMC and The Walking Dead, you probably don't even need me to say anything because you've already been watching the show anyway. Um, because it's a you know it's a fine show. They have good music. There's fairly good acting. There's some really kick-ass action. Too bad it only happens during the pilot. But there's not anything new. It doesn't really progress the story in an interesting way. It just spreads it out. It takes like one or two issues of a comic and really, really, really spreads it out across 10 hours. Because they introduce other stuff, like the Sandoval Killers, his introduction, which is way later in the comics, like the fourth volume, that's throughout the first season. They really introduce that badass character. Um, but as uh, you know, a real fan of the source material, I kind of was like, I guess that was okay. Like, at least I enjoyed it more than what I've seen of The Walking Dead, so it gets kudos from that. Um, just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan of AMC television to begin with, so I, I, like, I went in with an obvious bias. But yeah, I was pretty let down by the journey of that first season, because there isn't really a journey. Like, I don't know, I'm still curious to check it out at some point, but I mean, it really, it does depend on word of mouth. I, you know, like, I wasn't horribly excited by that pilot. There were things that I really liked about it. Yeah, there's some kick-ass stuff in the pilot, but... yeah. Um, and I don't, I, don't I hear there's more. even, I hear there's a little, there's more in some places, but so I just kind of spoiled it. The town blows up at the end of the season. So you're all not these the first person to tell me cause it's in yeah. the comic. Yeah. yeah. All these characters that you might've cared about that you learned about throughout this first season, they all did besides the main three besides well, see, Cassie, I don't know if... Tulip and Jesse. So it's kind of a worthless season when you think well, about it. TV shows I mean, what, would you say it's like characters. season one of Game of Thrones? Because that's what no, that does. Yeah, no, no, no. Like there's, one there's someone person, very specifically. Yeah. One person that's important dies there. A big you, one, yeah. But you still get everyone else. Everyone that you've been following. All these different strings. Basically, everyone's dead here. But yeah, it was kind of like, huh. I knew this was probably going to happen because it's in the first issue. Just not this early? No, not this early, but I thought it... If they were going to do it, they were going to do it sooner. And that, therefore, because it's not like I really cared about any of these characters anyway. But it was just kind of really bizarre in like an AMC fashion. Like, like I said, I don't watch their content. But I will, I'll turn in again, like I said, for the season f- uh, premiere. Just to see where it's going now since it's in like full comics mode. Like, it, like one of the fir- last things they say on the episode is, I guess we're going to go search for God now. It's like, yep. Let's go do it. Like, that's all I wanted. I wanted the whole season to be that. So, a little disappointed, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's not bad television. It's just as... It's not the adaptation I was looking for. Thanks for listening. We hope it's been a pleasure. If you like this show and you want to hear more of our wonderful voices on a weekly basis, check out Two Cents. I'll recap what's happened in film, TV, and tech news. We're also on Debt to Cinema, where one or both of us crosses a title off our list of shame. You can find all of our content at dollarreviews.net. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook at Dollar Reviews. And we're also on Google Play Music, iTunes, Pocket Cast, TuneIn, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, just about anywhere on the internet with hours of content available to you for free. But for those of you that feel that the show is worth your dollar, you can send us a donation at patreon.com slash dollarreviews. Contributions not only earn our undying love, but they also make it possible for us to improve our recording equipment and to give you the highest quality episodes possible. But more importantly, they'd be helping us acquire the content to review. You know, trips to the multiplex are expensive, and the more donations we receive, the more films we can review for your listening pleasure. If you listen somewhere we're currently not available, you'd like to contribute some talking points, send a debt to cinema request, or if you just want to laugh at us, you can do so by reaching out to us on social media or send an email to brian at dollarreviews.net. Or you can email me as well, steve at dollarreviews.net. You can follow me personally on Twitter at brian gillis, that's B R Y O N. 
O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S, and now you know how to spell the email too, and also under the same name on the Love You site letterbox, which acts as my film diary, where I rate films I'm watching, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at S underscore MTX, and also follow my film diary at letterbox under the same name, where I log everything I watch, and sometimes write brief reviews. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep the change. Jesus.